Welcome to Speak for Yourself from the crib. Jason Whitlock, Marcellus Wiley on a hump day. Happy Wednesday to you, America. All right, we have an awesome show planned for you today. Fox Sports College football analyst Brady Quinn is going to stop by the show and talk some NFL draft. Uh, and then we have a very special guest. About 40 minutes from now, Tony Baselli, the all-time great offensive tackle who came down with coronavirus and had to go to the Mayo Clinic. We're going to pull up at his crib down in Florida and interview him. You don't want to miss that. But we're going to start by going out to Ohio and our man Eric Mangini. He joins us from his crib. Uh, and that is the same Eric Mangini you used to see on this show. He is now one meal Mangini matching one meal Whitlock. Look at Mangini. Looks like he weighs about 185 pounds. Awesome to have you here. All right, guys, let's talk about the big news in the NFL. Rob Gronkowski has reunited with Tom Brady. This is amazing. This is incredible. The New England Patriots, Bill Belichick, yesterday trades Gronkowski to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for a fourth round pick. Of course, Gronkowski was retired all of last year and dropped a bunch of weight. Now he says he's back up to 260 pounds. Can't wait to reunite with Tom Brady down in Tampa. Sounds like Gronkowski retired a year ago claiming his body and injuries and he just couldn't put up with it anymore. Uh, but now he reappears in Tampa with Tom Brady. I'm wondering if any of this is a bad look for Bill Belichick and the Patriot way. The two greatest Patriots, perhaps. Now, I, I take that back. John Hanna would be my number two. But the two greatest Patriots of the modern era have both relocated to Tampa Bay away from Bill Belichick. Bad look for Belichick and the Patriot way, Marcellus? Not at all. Uh, it's not because, look, they're going down to Florida in their retirement home in Tampa Bay. Both of these guys collectively, with all that they've earned and the equity that they've gotten from their experience with the Patriots. So the Patriot way, if you're in it to win it, you have to do it the Patriot way. It's been the most successful model we've seen in football. But at the same time, doesn't mean that it's the most fun you can have in that journey to success. But let's be real, we've all grown up around people who had more fun than us, didn't sacrifice the same, didn't dedicate themselves the same. And most, if not all of those people who had more fun than us turned out to not be much. <laughs> so that's just how the game goes. And I'm a guy who didn't get into the NFL experience focused on necessarily getting a Super Bowl trophy, but those who did, you do it the Patriot way, that's going to reap you the most reward. So look at these guys now. They have the equity. They can't lose. Even if they go to Tampa Bay and fall flat on their face, both of these guys, they're still New England Patriots Super Bowl champion six times and three times over. So there's nothing for these guys to really risk except going out the way that they want to, having some fun. Yeah, th th this is absolutely on brand for the Patriots and, and for Bill Belichick. He takes an asset that wasn't doing anything and translates that into a, a fourth round draft pick. He wasn't going to come back and, and play in New England, and, and that's fine. But he's able to trade him to Tampa Bay, get the $10 million, the $9 million that would have potentially come onto the cap had he unretired and forced them to make decisions. He gets that off, off of the cap, and then he, he translates it into an asset. You know, from, from Gronkowski's standpoint, he goes down to, to Tampa Bay making $9 million. There's no state income tax. You know, you realize after a year off, it's hard to make 9 or $10 million just doing WWE and endorsements like that. So I'm, I'm sure that that's a lot more attractive. And you're a year further away from um, all the, the, the things and, and things that hurt. And you think, okay, I can go do it one more time. So to me, this is not a reflection on the Patriot way at all. If anything, it's completely on brand for what Bill does. Listen, I, I hear all that. And look, Bill Belichick doesn't have to apologize to anybody for the way he operates, the way he runs the Patriots. He's the greatest coach perhaps in, we've ever seen in sports history, certainly the greatest coach in NFL history and football history. I, I don't want to take any shots at Bill Belichick. However, I do think this is fascinating that Tom Brady, 
I got one of maybe the most respected player in the NFL in the last 20 or 30 years clearly has said that he started thinking about leaving New England a year ago. He wanted out of there. Here's Gronkowski, fun-loving, one of the greatest tight ends we've ever seen in all of football. He, tired of doing it the Patriot way and the Bill Belichick way, retires and then magically reappears in Tampa within two, three, four weeks after Tom Brady lands there. Some of this, to me, is a look of like, hey, if Brady and Gronk are tired of Belichick and the Patriots' way, there is a message being sent around the league. And so I, I, this, to me, is a bit of a bad look. And look, Bill Belichick can afford a boatload of bad looks. He's coached in nine Super Bowls. He's won six. He won two as a defensive coordinator. It would take a lot of bad looks for anybody to diminish what Bill Belichick has accomplished. But I do think there is a slight bad look of two of all-time greats that are somewhat saying it's just not any fun playing in New England anymore. You can only take so much of that. We had Ben Watson on the program earlier, and he played seven of his 16 seasons in New England and said that he was kind of worn out after his first six years in New England. He circled back late in his career. I, I do think this is somewhat, without diminishing Bill Belichick, this is somewhat of a bad look for the Patriots. I really yeah, don't think I, I it don't. is. I think this, oh, I'm sorry, Coach, but I, I just think this maps on to what, what our world is in terms of what it takes to climb that mountain of success in life. It's not the same thing it takes to stay at that top, stay at that apex. And I think that right now you're just seeing the mentality of two guys who they're like, look, we, we put all that we had to, to get to a certain place. But now that we're here, uh, that equity that I talked about before is something that they want to cash in. So the success of the Patriots is amazing, but all that glitters ain't gold. There, there's certainly underneath surfaces and layers as we're learning from watching the MJ documentary throughout their dynasty that the surface level is not the only level in which people are feeling or are really experiencing that greatness. So this is just two guys who have so much in the bank in terms of accolades, success, accomplishment in football that decided finally maybe we want to cash some of this in and have to do it somewhere else because we know how Belichick runs his bank. You're not cashing in that equity. <laughs> I, I said it a long time ago when it, when it came to Tom Brady and his, his negotiations. You can't go through 20 years of, of benefiting from Bill's ruthless approach to, to player personnel. And, and he moved on from some great Patriots, whether it's Seymour or, or Vrabel or take your pick. He, he's traded a bunch of them away. Logan Mankins, he traded to, to Tampa Bay. So you can't benefit from that and then be surprised when it happens to you. So they had a disagreement as to what his worth should be. I think with, with Gronkowski, you do spend a year away from the game. You're not making anywhere as much near as much money. You have a chance to go do that again with, with a friend, with a guy that you have a relationship with in a place that has no state income tax. To me, that's more opportunistic than any sort of, of, of indictment on, on New England. And look, they're going to experience something different in Tampa Bay and it's one of those things where the grass isn't always greener when you go to a new place. Yeah, it may be shinier and, and it may look better, but winning is a lot of fun. And those guys are used to that type of fun. We'll see. All right, Marcellus, you referenced something. The Michael Jordan last chance documentary, what went on with the Chicago Bulls and their dynasty. There was some. Obviously, some animus, Michael Jordan, Jerry Krause, Scottie Pippen, Jerry Krause. I don't know if this is the right word, if, if Brady and Gronk want to embarrass Bill Belichick, but do you think they'd like to humble him and prove that it wasn't just his system? There's a, another way to win games in the NFL. I don't think they're trying to embarrass him. I don't think they're trying to humble him. I think they're trying to enlighten him that there are different ways up this mountain. Um, we, we understand that the Patriot way has been the most successful model, but that's not been the only way up the mountain in terms of 
how you go through that process and the level of enjoyment you may have in success. If we go back to the dynasties in the 80s and the 49ers, I remember hearing stories about how the 49ers had contactless practices and never hit after September. And everyone was like, what? How do they win championships like that? Meanwhile, in New York and Bill Parcells, they're dying every single day on the field to get a couple of championships. So there's just many ways up the, the mountain in terms of the way that you approach the game. So we can look at that documentary as well. Everyone praises Michael Jordan and his killer instinct and how he went out there and was an assassin. But then we also have to respect Magic Johnson and his five championships and how he did it with a smile and kissing the opponents before the game and still went out there and gave you buckets. So I think if anything, Gronk and Brady want to show Belichick, hey, you can smile on the way up this mountain and enlighten him to a different way. Look, Bill's about to be 69 years old. I don't think he's going to change that much. You know, I, I, my experience is as people get older, they tend to get more uh, resolute in, in, in what they believe in. And I don't think this is a function of, of trying to necessarily embarrass Bill. They want to do well in, in their opportunity that they have. And, and that's not a function of needing to embarrass someone else by them doing well. I, I think one of the things they both have to consider is not embarrassing themselves. They're going to a situation where uh, a ton is going to be expected from them because of what they've done in a completely different system and a completely different environment. And they're going to have to be able to to deliver at that that same level. And with with Gronkowski, two of the past three seasons, you know, what do you have? Forty five catches and and twenty five catches and three touchdowns in two of those three seasons. And now he's a season away. So we'll have to see where he is and, you know, how well Tom adjusts to, to the new environment as well. And this is a this is a completely different situation because you can't spend time in the building. He's going to come in and, and, and have to adjust to everything with very limited exposure. And then who knows what kind of offseason. All right. Hey, guys, very quickly, because we got to go. We got to get to break 10, 15 seconds each. Is this going to work for Brady and Gronkowski? I think expectations are high now. It's with all these weapons. It's about winning the Super Bowl. Do you think this is going to work, their move to Tampa? Marcellus, Eric, very quickly. I think it's going to work. Um, I think the expectations of a Super Bowl championship are too lofty with this offseason, with all the integration of key parts uh, so fast. I think just making the playoffs and threatening others being a contender is what you should expect. Yeah, if the expectation is playoffs, then, then I think it's got a good chance of working if the expectation is that they're going to win the Super Bowl, I think that's too much to ask for at, at, at this point and, and with the environment we're in. All right. Thank you, Eric. You look awesome. Some inspiration for me. One meal Mangini kicking one meal Whitlock. But <laughs> all right, stick around. Brady Quinn, Fox Sports college football expert. He's going to join us from his crib. Speak for yourself from the crib presented by Hyundai. More after this. Whether you're working from home or working on your fitness, you want what you're listening to to be what you're listening to and not what your roommates, neighbors, children, or significant others are listening to. Everyone needs a great pair of wireless earbuds. But before you go dropping hundreds of dollars on a pair, you need to check out the wireless earbuds from Raycon. My own pair of Raycon earbuds are better and easier to use than anything else I've tried. They're comfortable and easy to set up and work seamlessly with all of my devices. Having a pair of wireless earbuds is a serious game changer for me. You already know Raycon earbuds start at about half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds on the market and that they sound just as amazing as the other top audio brands you know. Their newest model, the Everyday E25 earbuds, are their best ones yet with six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a more compact design that gives you a nice, noise-isolating fit. Raycon's wireless earbuds are so comfortable, perfect for conference calls or binging podcasts. They're easy to set up and pair with your device. Seriously, 
They're a game changer. Unlike some of your other wireless options, Raycon earbuds are both stylish and discreet with no dangling wires or stems to distract anyone during video calls. You've heard me talk about how the company was co-founded by Ray J and celebrities like Snoop Dogg and J.R. Smith are obsessed with Raycons. Pick up a pair and see what the hype is all about. Now's the time to get the latest and greatest from Raycon. Get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com slash speak. That's buyraycon.com slash speak for 15% off Raycon wireless earbuds. Buyraycon.com slash speak. The greatest leader in college football history, Jalen Hurts. Jalen, uh, are you trying to break some news with that Cowboys banner behind you and the name Hurt? Mm. What, am I looking at that properly? Uh, are you campaigning to go to Dallas? Mm. Look, I didn't, I didn't even mm. think about that before I said right here. <laughs> Too late. Yeah, it's just on the wall from when we were kids in high school. That's my brother's name right there if I move my head. Um, oh. It's over there, but... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, see, like, yeah, I'm a, yeah. <laughs> Technical difficulties. <laughs> Let me get it. That's going to be all over the internet. You trying to replace that oh, man. Yeah, man. That's going to be all over the internet. Nice one, though. <laughs> Welcome back to Speak for Yourself from the crib. Jason Whitlock, Marcellus Wiley on a Wednesday afternoon. Speak for Yourself presented to you by Hyundai. All right, let's move to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Former Notre Dame and NFL quarterback Brady Quinn joins us from Fort Lauderdale. Brady looking good as always. All right, let's start with Dak Prescott and the Dallas Cowboys. Rumors starting to float about what the Cowboys will do with the 17th pick overall. Uh, Rumors uh, focusing in on Utah State quarterback Jordan Love and would the Cowboys be interested in taking Love, who's seen as a guy that might not be ready to play as a rookie, but has a lot of upside should the Cowboys target a quarterback with the 17th pick, Marcella? Oh, man. Y'all really don't like Dak for anybody who's taking it. The Cowboys with the 17th pick in the first round should go try and draft a franchise quarterback when they already have a franchise quarterback and also have them in a favorable situation in terms of contract. If you want to look at it for the long term, Dallas wants to give him a five-year deal. He wants a four-year deal. Whatever that is, it's going to be 160 to $200 million. That's just the way the game goes for a franchise quarterback going forward. That said, if they don't want to go long term, they just want to keep it short term, they can franchise him as they did this year and next year. That will be two years, $70 million. Once again, favorable term for a franchise quarterback. Why would Dallas want to roll the dice on Jordan Love to see if he could become what Dak already is? This is baseless. No way are they drafting a quarterback at the 17th pick. This is all about leverage. This is the Dallas Cowboys trying to do one of two things. Either push Dak to come to the table and negotiate or lower what he's asking for, or they're trying to convince teams that they might potentially be in the market for a quarterback at that spot. And if Jordan Love drops down to them, they could potentially take him. And so maybe they're looking for some trade partners to potentially trade up and take Jordan Love so they could trade back and accumulate some more picks. So I think this really accomplishes twofold. One, putting pressure on Dak with the possibility of them taking a quarterback in this year's draft, but also letting people out there know that they potentially could be in the market to trade back. I don't read into this as all as anything legitimate. I think the Dallas Cowboys are going to take best player available at that spot if they can't move back. Dak's their quarterback. They'll come to an agreement at some point. This league is all about what have you done for me lately? And unfortunately, Jordan Love's film this past year, even though he does have some legitimate excuses, it's not enough to convince them that he's a must-take quarterback and player at that spot for the Dallas Cowboys. They've already got their quarterback. Disagree with both of you all. Dak had a career year, his greatest year, and the Cowboys didn't make the playoffs. And now he wants to be the highest paid quarterback in football or the highest paid player in football. They can't reach an agreement. I wouldn't blame him for taking a a quarterback at 17. Jordan loves somebody. They don't have a backup quarterback. And you just don't know what Dak's future is. Maybe Dak at his best leads to eight and eight. 
So I wouldn't have a problem with it. All right, let's move on to the San Francisco 49ers and their general manager, John Lynch, who publicly acknowledged, pretty transparent, that he and head coach Kyle Shanahan talked about the possibility of acquiring Tom Brady this offseason and moving on from Jimmy Garoppolo. Lynch and Shanahan eventually, after 24 hours of thought, agreed they like Jimmy Garoppolo. Stay the course. We're not going to make the move for Tom Brady. All right, Brady Quinn, smart for the 49ers to stick with Jimmy Garoppolo over Tom Brady. Yes, and by the way, this is what good general managers and coaches do. They, they go ahead and they exhaust all efforts of looking how to improve their team and make their roster better. So they talk about these sort of, of we can call them hypothetical situations, even though there could have been a legitimate chance they could have gotten Tom Brady, but they found out that it wasn't a good fit for them. And it's honestly probably not when you look at Kyle Shanahan's system, what he likes to do with a lot of the move, the pocket uh, and, and boots and things of that nature that Tom Brady's not going to be doing at 42, 43 years old. Now, that's not to say that Kyle Shanahan wouldn't be able to work a system around Tom Brady that would allow him to be effective or good on that team. But I think they're better off right now with Jimmy Garoppolo because the problem for the 49ers is, let's just say hypothetically they were going to make that move. You would still have to be in the quarterback market, if not this year, potentially next year, to solve that problem again. And, and, and meanwhile, you've got Jimmy Garoppolo under contract for three more years at a really economical value when you look at what Dak Prescott's asking for, which we just talked about. And then Russell Wilson and, and everyone, every other quarterback that comes up, it's going to keep setting that ball higher and higher and higher. So I, I think for Jimmy Garoppolo in his first year starting 16 complete games to help his team go to a Super Bowl, I think it's only upside from here for me with Jimmy Garoppolo. I think they're better off staying with Jimmy G. Yeah, definitely smarter staying with Jimmy G. Uh, they're on a different calendar, different schedule than the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in terms of why did they roll the dice for Tom Brady at this age is because they didn't even make the playoffs versus a team that was in the fourth quarter leading a Super Bowl. So why would you want to hit the reset button in any respect by trying to acquire Tom Brady? As Brady just said, you will be back in the quarterback market in a year or two trying to find who's next. Well, you have who's next right now on your roster, and it's Jimmy G, who has the highest winning percentage of all quarterbacks ever after 25 games, more than even a young Tom Brady. So they're smart to stay pat. Yeah, for all the reasons you guys said, I think it's definitely smart. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo, I think he's a little loose with the football, but the guy's still just 27, 28, 29 years old. He's still in the prime of his career. Financially, it works out better for you. He's on a good contract, good deal. I agree with you guys. All right, let's move on to Marcellus's favorite quarterback in the upcoming draft, Tua Tung Viola. Mm. Tua mm. is a mystery to a lot of people. Is he an injury prone guy? Is he too short? Is a left hander being, you know, is that a problem being a left handed quarterback? So, Brady, start us off. Tell us who Tua is and why. Tua Tung Viola is the blank and why. I think he's going to be one of the next superstars. If he can stay healthy, I mean, that's the caveat here, right? Because of the hip injury. But if he can stay healthy, I do think he's going to be one of the next superstars as a quarterback at the NFL level. When you really break down his game and you look at some of the skills, and you try to compare him to some of the quarterbacks that are already playing within the league. I mean, the guy that I see the most of when I see him move around and buy time or create is Russell Wilson. I mean, dating back to Russell Wilson's time at NC State, and really, Wisconsin, you saw some of that. Now, their throwing motions are entirely different. Russell, uh, Russell Wilson is much longer motion, whereas two is much more compact. Uh, but this kid's got the complete package, and I think teams are more apt to look at a quarterback of his stature not being the tallest or the heaviest or biggest, and they're okay with that because of some of the intangibles that he brings. So I do think if he's able to stay healthy, he's going to be one of the next superstars at the next level but, you know, that's a big question mark right now because we don't know the situation and circumstance that he's entering into. And, and that might be the biggest question mark for him is not just the hip, but if he goes and plays behind a bad offensive line, even as mobile as he can be, like we've seen on film, that could be a big time injury, you know, issue for a guy that could get banged up and may never reach his capability at the NFL level. 
Yeah, I, I just think he's the next great quarterback. Superstar is even better way of describing him. Uh, if you look at what the future of the quarterback position looks like in terms of success and accolade, we obviously have Patrick Mahomes. You have Deshaun Watson right there, Lamar Jackson. And if you want to say a future Mount Rushmore based on these youngsters who are going to be great, I think you have to put Tua's name in there as well. He'll be the fourth one of that group because he throws the football better than anyone I've seen coming out of college in terms of accuracy, in terms of how he displays his mental acumen, reading the defenses, being able to do it all. There's not one conversation Anyone is having about Tua translating his game to the pro level. Only conversation is, will he be durable enough? And no one knows that answer for him or any other prospect. So if he can stay healthy, trust me, he'll be on that Mount Rushmore of future quarterbacks, just like the other three. Uh, Tua Tungvaola is the most confused quarterback in this draft. And I say that not trying to take a giant pot shot at the guy, but Joel Klatt said something on this show last week that I found interesting and rang true for me. Tua Tungvaola thinks he's Steve Young, thinks he's Russell Wilson. And facts are, he's not. He's not that mobile of a quarterback, and he needs to tailor his game or limit his game a little bit more. He keeps getting hurt when trying to leave the pocket He's not a running quarterback like a Steve Young. He's not even on Russell Wilson's level. And if he doesn't start changing the way he views himself and start understanding what his limitations are, these injuries that have piled up on him at Alabama are going to pile up even quicker if he decides to get out of the pocket in the NFL and some of these guys in, on these defenses in the NFL get a hold of him. His career will be short unless that confusion goes away. Brady? Thank you so much for joining us today. Look forward to having you back. Great job. Have some fun down in there in Fort Lauderdale. All right, when we come back, Jimmy Jackson's going to join us. Darnell's question of the day. Anybody got a problem with Michael Jordan and his light criticism of Scottie Pippen in the first two episodes of the Last Chance documentary? All right, speak for yourself from the crib, presented by Hyundai. Or after this. My guy. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself from the Crib. Jason Whitlock, Marcellus Wiley. Happy Wednesday. All right, time now for Darnell's question of the day. We'll go out to his crib and the crib of Jim Jackson. Uh, Darnell, Jim, Darnell, take it away. Oh, there you go. Darnell, take it away. (laughs) Yes, sir. Let's talk the last thing. The new documentary about Michael Jordan and the Bulls. The doc got a lot of people talking about Scottie Pippen's conflict with Bulls management. And in the film, Michael Jordan actually criticized Pippen for having surgery late and missing part of the season. But some are now criticizing Jordan with Draymond Green saying he was disappointed when Jordan called out Pippen. So Jim, I'm gonna start with you. Do you have a problem with what MJ did? You know, I don't have a problem. I think a lot of people are disappointed because it is MJ, and probably at the time he didn't say it. But we all know that in situations like that, when there's turmoil, you're not really going to speak on it that time because you don't want to disrupt the apple cart, and, and, and so to speak. I mean, you see it right now with what's going on with Draymond and um, KD. During, during the time... Those two guys were trying to downplay what was happening within the locker room concept, okay? But now you remove yourself from the situation, you hear a lot more things going coming out. This is typical in sports because at the time of what may be going on, as a teammate, you understand what Scottie Pippen is going through. He may it may be wrong on your end what he's doing, but you're not going to kind of put him out there. Look at DeAndre Hopkins right now with football. He talked about he didn't have a relationship with Bill O'Brien for six years. Well, during the course of the, you know, the seasons, you didn't talk about it. But post that time, now it all comes out. So, I, you know, for me, I don't like calling players out, but I understand the dynamics of what's going on and why it comes out later in regards to Michael voicing his opinion rather than during the time of the event that it was happening – of why they chose to keep, keep things in the house. I'm with Draymond. I did have a, a problem with it. Uh, and, and look, 
watching Michael Jordan talk about something that happened 20 plus years ago had me cringing just because he was being hypercritical of a teammate that he knew exactly what his teammate was going through and feeling at that time. And all this time that has elapsed has not resolved that feeling of blame or Michael Jordan trying to make Scottie Pippen responsible for all of his actions based on how he was feeling about his contract and being underpaid. If you're Michael Jordan, you have to look at this situation with some empathy, with some respect for your teammate and his perspective. So I thought that, look, what Scottie Pippen did was not just passive aggressive, it was displaced aggression. And it was really unfortunate because it, it, he took it out on his teammates. He took it out on the team. So it was understandable that Michael Jordan felt a certain way. But then what you should justify his behavior or at least let time dissolve your animus towards his behavior is the fact that you understand why he did it in the first place. So all crimes are not committed with the same intention. And this was one that obviously the players had to suffer through. But in reality, you know why Scottie Pippen had to go to those lengths. And I thought he would show a little more compassion than Jordan did. I want to add a little context before I comment on this. I want to be crystal clear with people. When Michael Jordan was playing, I'm a hardcore Indiana Pacer fan. I did (laughs) not like Michael Jordan just as a fan. I'm turned into this Michael Jordan defender, damn near groupie, because I feel like I'm forced to. And so I'm going to say it, do it here again. Michael Jordan, to me, has done absolutely nothing wrong here. In the time, when this was going on, he showed Scottie Pippen great support by figuring out a way to keep the Bulls competitive while Scottie Pippen was trying to handle his business, while he was going at it with Bulls management. He handled it at the time. This never came out. Now, even at 56, 57, 58 years old, whatever Jordan is, even now he's being loyal to Scottie Pippen. This alleged criticism, very mild, but also needs to be understood in the context of the first two episodes of this documentary and what we think is going to be the rest of the documentary. Michael Jordan is taking a massive shot at Jerry Krause and Jerry Reinsdorf. He's heavily involved with this documentary. And it is a shot at the incompetence and the greed and the bigotry of Jerry Krause and Jerry Reinsdorf. That's what the last chance doc is. He is defending Scottie Pippen with this documentary and pointing out the stupidity of these two guys that ruined this dynasty. Now, in his 50s, and one day, Darnell, you'll be there and others will be there. You start looking back things in retrospect and start thinking about how I should have handled it. And so I'm sure Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen have had the conversation like, you know what, man, we were going for our second three P. It was over with at that point in terms of you ever getting the money out of Jerry Reinsdorf. So you having this surgery late really served no purpose. You would have been better off just playing it out because you were leaving anyway and you ended up getting your money from Houston and Portland and other places. There was a better way to handle it in that season than what Scottie Pippen. And I guarantee you, Michael and Scottie have had this conversation and probably agree. I just don't see the shot here at Scottie Pippen. I see Michael Mm -hmm. Jordan loyal to him in 97, 98 and in 2020 taking a big dump on Jerry Krause and Jerry Reinsdorf. Hats off to Michael Jordan. Well, he, with too, but to take it a step further, too, during that time, he did come out and support Scotty, even when the doctor said, you know, okay, let's take a look and see if it will um, heal itself before we go to surgery. But during the course of the year, he tried to figure out Michael Jordan, okay, ways the team has to still continue to win games where Scotty was out. But if you look at society and itself in business, it happens across the board. You have disgruntled employees who leave later, whether they're a partner in a law firm, if they're a doctor, a lawyer, it didn't matter. When they're going through some kind of turmoil with the company, they kind of support the narrative of the company at that time. But if you get them away four or five years away from the situation, they're going to kind of spill the beans on what's been going on. I guarantee you, a little bit later after Tom Brady retired, okay, 
it's going to be some things said about his tenure in time at New England that he would not say at the time that he was there. He may sound like he's throwing somebody under the bus, but he's giving you context on what he felt at the time and how he's feeling now. Is it right? I'm not going to say it's right, but it's natural because we see it all the time across the board, whether it's sport, whether it's politics, or whether it's business. Thank you, Jim. Mm. All right, we got to keep it moving. Tony Baselli, an all-time great NFL offensive tackle, former USC Trojan. He's going to join us from his crib down in Florida and tell us how he survived the coronavirus. Speak for yourself from the crib presented by Hyundai or after this. That's my dog. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself from the crib presented by Hyundai. Time to pull up down in Ponte Vedra, Florida, right outside of Jacksonville. And let's talk to Tony Baselli former NFL great, a member of the 1990 All-Decade team, awesome left tackle. All right, Tony, but you're now known for you came down with and you survived the coronavirus. Now, look, you lost a bunch of weight. You're a triathlete. You're one of the greatest NFL players of all time. How did you come down with corona? Well, first of all, let's let's put let's hold the brakes on the triathlete. That was a long time ago. Right when I got done football, I'm back to being (laughs) fat again. And so I'm, I'm all over the place. Uh, I need to go on your diet. I need right. to get something going there. But yeah, I mean, it was crazy. I mean, I, you know, the whole thing starts with, you know, you hear about this coronavirus. I wasn't worried about it much. And I started feeling sick and found out that I was at an event where someone had it. And next thing I knew, I get tested and I come back positive. My wife was positive. My two boys end up getting it. And even after I got it, you know, I didn't think much of it because I'm healthy. I'm 47 years old. It's not a big deal. And uh, a couple of days later, I end up in the ICU at Mayo Clinic. So it was a crazy process. What did this experience teach you about yourself? Well, I tell you, it makes you appreciate uh, every day and the people around you, the people, you know, family and friends, because you know, the uncertainty of what was going on was eye opening to me because I go to the hospital after my doctor told me to go and I, I in the, in the uh, emergency room and this, they take x-rays of my uh, lungs and they say, Hey, you need to go to the ICU. And next thing I know, I got all these smart doctors telling me they don't know what's going to happen to me. And they're putting me on oxygen, putting me on all these drugs. I'm thinking, what do you mean? What do you mean? You don't know what's going to happen to me. Like I could die from this. And you realize, yeah, because people are dying from this virus. So, it makes you, you know, have some serious conversations with God and uh, it also makes you say, all right, there's no guarantees in this life. Let's enjoy, uh, let's enjoy what you got and the family, the friends and uh, make the most of it. Now, Tony, let's stay with this experience. Like physically, what did you feel? How was your body feeling when you were experiencing this? Marcellus, you remember when you play up my high and you can't breathe and you can't catch your breath? Uh, in Denver during a game. I mean, that's, yeah, and so, yeah. I mean, and so it's like all of a sudden I'm, you know, I've, one day I wake up, my lungs are full of fluid and I'm, I'm not saying I can't breathe, but my, you know, I'm wheezing and, and it's a struggle. It's I'm laboring is the best way to say it. And when I got to that point is uh, you start you hearing the reports, you get scary. Plus your whole body just feels like you have the flu, I guess. I mean, you're, you're sore, you're tired, you're fatigued. And, uh, and so it was as bad as I've ever felt. And, uh, and once you go through it, you know, feeling healthy again, you, I'll tell you, that's one of the things I won't take for granted because, you know, uh, that process, you know, made me really realize that health is something that is a blessing and it's a gift. And, uh, and when you have it, it's pretty good. Now, you ended up at the Mayo Clinic, as you said, and I'm certain that your mind had to go to some dark places. Did you ever think that you might not recover? Yeah, I mean, your mind goes really dark places. When they came in and said they had to up the oxygen levels I was on and it wasn't enough, and uh, and the pulmonologist came in and said, hey, we're not sure what this virus is going to do. We're going to do our best, We're going to, and we'll have to wait and see. At that moment, you know, the thought of is, am I going to die? in the ICU by myself because your family's not there. 
And you have to fight those thoughts. And I fought them. That's, I think, where my faith came in. And, you, you know, you have those conversations, you start praying, and you try to stay positive um, because it's a battle at that point. And if you give in to the negative thoughts, it's not going to be good for anybody. Now, I need you to put your doctor's hat on because your wife and your two sons also contracted corona, but your three daughters didn't. So what theories have you come up with why they didn't contract it? Either they got it and they're asymptomatic like a lot of people are, or they have the greatest immune systems in the history of mankind because they were, in, you know, my two boys came home from college. They were on spring break, which creates a chaotic situation in my house. Um, because my three girls are princesses, they're quiet, they're so good. My boys are nuts. And so here we all are in this house, all sick, and my girls are doing all the work. I mean, they're serving us, making us food, you know, cleaning up. And somehow they never got it, or they never got sick. So we're actually, as soon as the antibody tests come out and, and are more widespread, we're going to get them tested. And maybe they got it, and they were just asymptomatic. But uh, I'm glad that they didn't have to go through it. Now, what precautions are you taking and any concern that you can catch it a second time? Yeah, no, I'm not concerned about it. I mean, I actually just uh, did some uh, blood work uh, today again uh, at the Mayo Clinic to find out about the antibodies. I have, you know, very high anti uh, antibody count, antibodies count. Um, and so they say for right now, I'm immune. How long that immunity will last, you don't know. Um, but for right now, I, you know, uh, my antibody level is high enough where I'm going to start giving, uh, donating blood and, and the plasma so they can spin out the uh, antibodies for really sick people. Uh, and so I'm waiting to hear uh, when I'll start giving, uh, giving blood so that hopefully it can help some people. So right now I think I'm okay. Um, and so, you know, I'm still trying to be smart, you know, because half the people, you know, you go out and I'm trying to ride my bike a little bit, get some exercise, build my lung capacity back up. And people look at it and they think, Oh, there's the, there's the Corona guy. There's Baselli. <laughs> and so, he, you, you know, you try to, you try to respect it. What I want to say is, listen, I'm the safest human being to be around right now. Um, because I already got it and do have the antibodies, but you know, so we're trying to be smart about it and uh, we'll see what comes, wh where it goes. Tony, let's move to your career. It was an incredible seven year run in the NFL, but probably a little shorter to make you a first ballot Hall of Famer. You've been a finalist four times. Go ahead and be a little arrogant. Make your case. Why should Tony Baselli be in the Hall of Fame? Well, I mean, I'm going to be careful because, you know, it's one of those things that self-promoting. I mean, it's not, I mean, Jason, you're an all offensive line, but that's not really what we do. I mean, that's the defensive guys. It's the wide receivers where we self-promote. I mean, but I think the, the greatest thing I could say for, you know, my career, what's meant most to me is the guys I played against who are in the Hall of Fame, said I was a Hall, say I'm a Hall of Famer. I mean, I played in an era where some of the best tackles who ever played the game, one that you, you know, Jason, from uh, really got behind when he, uh, Willie Rofe was coming up for the Hall of Fame as a great player. We played at the same time. And during that great era, I was first team all pro several times. And so I think those are the things, you know, my peers, what they say about me, um, the guys who played the position, that means more than anything. Um, obviously I want to be in the hall of fame one day. Uh, hopefully it, it happens and it, it works out. Um, but it's really, that's up to the voters and we'll wait and see what happens. Tony, I want to tell you a story. It's one of my favorite stories in the world. It's, it's something you probably don't know about, but, uh, I want to get your reaction to this story. So everyone always asks me who was the best tackle I ever played against. And then I say Walter Jones, but yep. what they don't ask me is, Who's the best tackle I've ever seen or evaluated or scouted? And it was you, Tony Baselli. So let me give you a little backstory on this. In 1996, you played against the Buffalo Bills in the playoffs. Yep. And you went against the Bruce Smith. And Bruce didn't have a sack in that game. And you guys won that playoff game. You come back in 1997. I'm a rookie. I'm not getting a lot of reps, especially in past situations. I'm just there for the run. And I remember that was an important game to Bruce. And he was looking forward to going against you again in 97. You shut him down again. Two times, Bruce Smith didn't get a sack on Tony Baselli. Fast forward to the next year. We're playing you in 1998. And now I'm I getting remember. reps. I'm going against. Yeah. And I was sitting there watching you, scouting you. 
And in the middle of scouting you, Bruce says, Marcellus, sit your ass down this week. You are not <laughs> going against him. He's all mine because he wanted to finally get one on you. But, Sally, let me tell you the truth. When he said that to me, everyone thought I should have felt embarrassed. I was so relieved because I was like, I do not want to go against that damn animal on the field. Now, that third time, he finally got a sack on you. But when you hear the great Bruce Smith had to go through that much of a mental anxiety going against you, how does it make you feel? Well, he's a great player. I mean, he's one of the best ever. And uh, I always love playing against him. And I've never been more scared going into a game as a second-year player in 1996. He was defensive MVP, and uh, no one had blocked him all year. So, uh, and I had a good game. It was fun. I like playing him. I like getting nasty with him. I like getting physical. And I like to go back and look at that third game or so. It might have been a coverage sack. I mean, I'm not sure. You know, we got to go. You know, sometimes Mark Brunel <laughs> like to hold the ball a little bit too long. And, and by the way, it's not like you had any day at the beach. You had to go on the other side against Leon Searcy, who was, you know. It wasn't easy to go against my man, Big Surce, either. But Sally, tell him. I thought I was actually doing better, and I was like, this is oh. hell over here as well. Cersei was yeah. so strong, right? Plus, his, pu <laughs> his, his punch will take your heart. He'll steal you. He'll break your chest plate with that punch of his. Yes. Tony, so really appreciate the time. We've run out of time, sadly. Marcellus probably doesn't know this, but coming out of college, a lot of people call Tony Baselli the next Jason Whitlock, Marcellus. Uh, put a lot of expectations. Well, no one knows that. I watched your tape at Ball State, and uh, I, you were a big influence of what not to do at left tackle. And so all the things I saw you do, I said, I think I could be a great player uh, if I don't do that. And then talking to Joel Schmangu, who played against you uh, at Ball State, he said, listen, I played against this guy named Jason Whitlock. I'm telling you. You're going to be a great player because you're nothing like him. So uh, I appreciate all you did. <laughs> all right, we got to go. Uncle Jimmy's around the corner. Don't go anywhere. Speak for yourself. From the crib, more after this.